Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here on this very chilly morning. I welcome you all to stand and worship with us.
Change, fall, fear.
What's up, guys? Hey, I'm Mark Smith, one of the student ministers here at DSM. I'm so glad you're with us. Whether you're sitting right here in these a little bit more normal, closer chairs, or whether you're online, uh, we're glad you're joining us. So thank you. Thank you. So I want to ask you a question and just jump right in. Are you guys, are you guys ready? Are you guys ready this morning? You guys ready? Ready to get a little, we're going to get a little nerdy maybe. We're going to get a little philosophical even. So maybe put your reading glasses on if you have those. I don't yet, but they're coming. And I look really bad in glasses, so oh well. It's okay. It just, you know, it's a thing. Or maybe like, can you guys do this with me? Like do a little, do a little British sipping of the tea. How's that go with the, with the pinky up? Anybody, sophist- any fellow sophisticants in here? You guys aren't, you aren't, you aren't doing it with me. Well, apparently that's how you do tea. I, I don't know. Is that true, Tyler? No. I call you tea sometimes. Yeah, there you go. All right. So guys, hey, a couple of weeks ago, we started our growth series called Why God? Like the big questions of life. Like, why would we even believe all of this Christian stuff in the first place, right? Are you guys aware that we're, we're talking about these things along with the rest of the church? Yes? I see some thumbs up. All right. Well, today, we're going to continue that. And if you guys will turn to your yellow books, if you have them to page 35, I need to go ahead and tell you that we found, like, an egregious error in our books. I don't know how this happened. It didn't happen in the adult books. But if you look at the top right of the talk notes pages, like page 35 for today, that scripture and stuff and all that is just incorrect. I think the, I think the date might be correct. But, and then from, from there on out for the rest of the book, it makes zero sense. It's all messed up. So sorry about that. So when you do your talk notes, like so many of you are doing, uh, just disregard that. You can cross it out with a, with a pen or whatever. Okay, so a couple weeks ago, Nathan launched us with a question, what about the Bible? And he concluded... One of the things he said is that, hey, guys, actually, the Bible as an ancient document, especially the New Testament, but really all of it, is the most well-preserved and most well-transmitted, pass-along ancient work of literature or work of literature, well, we'll say ancient ancient work of literature, known to human history. So, and and so that that statement is actually a fact. Like, you can can research that, the number of manuscripts, the number of copies, the accuracy of the transmission— Um, Yeah, you find little issues here or there, but the most accurate, way more accurate than Homer's Iliad or any Shakespeare or anything like that, which isn't even as old, so the Shakespeare part. So that's pretty amazing. Guys, the Bible is trustworthy. Last week, Carmel asked a question. Carmel. Carmel. Don't tell her I did that. Carmel asked a question, what about God? And, And we concluded with Carmel's leadership that that our very existence, the fact that we're even here and all this creation out there and the beautiful changes of the season, actually, the creation actually points to a creator. And it points far more to a creator than it's as if by some random chance. And then you can't really argue with how God has impacted people's lives and changed their lives and how he can change your life. And actually, that's my prayer for you this morning and going forward. So today our question is, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Kind of a big question. Why would I even believe in Jesus? Now, I'm not, I need to tell you, I'm not going to prove anything to you 100% today. Because honestly, to prove Jesus and everything he said and did and that was accomplished, to prove it to you factually 100% is not possible. Because it does take a leap of faith. It does take a faith step. That's what faith is. But let's consider it sort of like a courtroom, if you will. Where a jury has to, you know what, you know, like the whole jury thing, judge, big gavel. I don't, do you guys watch TV, courtroom? Yeah. Is that stuff even true? Uh, anyways, I feel like it's all an act. But anyways, like, you've heard the phrase, a lawyer might have to, or a lawyer has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt whether somebody is guilty or innocent. We can do that today. Maybe not get it all done in this few minutes, but we can make a really good start. Beyond a reasonable doubt, we're going to make a case. So I'm going to jump in, and as we talk today, I want you to bear in mind that ancient historians, back to the earliest centuries, ancient historians like Josephus and Tacitus and Herodotus all 
talk about this historical figure named Jesus. So Jesus, like, it's for sure he existed as a man. There are some people who will try to say otherwise, and even if I wasn't a Christian, if I was just an historian, guys, they're just reaching. Like, it's, it's really way out there to say Jesus didn't actually exist as a man. Um, there's, there's just really no doubt that he was an historical figure. So let's bear that in mind. Okay, so once upon a time, once upon a time, I was sitting with a friend of mine. This is a true story, 100% true story. And this guy was just super tall, super tall dude. So we're just, we're just going to call him my tall friend, if that's okay. So my tall friend and I had lunch and things like that. And he would tell me that he didn't really believe in anything as far as like divine God or anything like that. He just sort of believed in a general goodness in the world and some kind of spirituality. And I would just, I would honestly kind of point out that, well, you know, that goodness you believe in, that's, that's God and that spirituality. God's the author of that. But anyways, he was actually probably more of a Buddhist than he was an atheist. Atheist meaning he doesn't believe in anything. He was probably more of a Buddhist if, if uh, we really got down to it. But we went to lunch one time. We were talking about God. And he, at one point, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking, and he just kind of blurts out, Mark, are you trying to convert me? You know, sort of glib, sort of smart, smart. Like, I mean, he wasn't aggressive. He's trying to convert me. And my answer was quickly, well, that's between you and God. So, well, no, that's, that's actually between you and God. Like, I wouldn't be doing any of the converting. He wouldn't be doing any of the, I wouldn't be doing any of the converting. He would be the one doing the accepting, not me, between you and God. But I wish, and I did say more, but I wish I would have said even more. I wish I would have just laid it all out there, of course, in a respectful way. And by the way, I did know this guy. We had a relationship. Um, I had listened to his beliefs. I would heard him out. I had, as I like to say, I'd earned the right to speak. I had some relational equity. Like, I, I knew him. We were friends. I, I, I could say stuff to him. I, I wish I would have just gone for all of it. I wish, I wish if I would have just, and we did keep talking, we did keep talking, but I wish I would have just laid it out. And if I would have done that, it would have gone something like this. Tall guy? That was, remember, that's what I call him. Tall guy. Like, well, shoot, tall guy. Like, am I trying to convert you? Well, I mean, believe, I believe that Jesus is the only way. And, and I want to share that, not ball hog it or something, not hog it. And I, and I don't think I'm better than you. I'm, I don't, I'm not high, this isn't high and mighty. I'm not trying to get a notch in my belt or a trophy on my shelf or check a box or add you to my number of people that's been whatever converted. I actually just, I wish I would have said, tall man, I, tall friend, I, I really just believe everything depends on this. And I care about you, man. I care about you. Tall man, what if I had the answer to all life's questions, struggles, triumph, triumphs, the reason for triumphs? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't you want me to share that with you? That's what I should have said. Guys, I want to suggest to you this morning that because of what Jesus claims, because of what he says about life and the world and himself and salvation. Because of what he says, you and I have to make a decision about what he says. One way or another, we got to make a decision about Jesus. It's like, I don't know, a goofy example. Let's say you go to eat lunch today, and the waitress or your mom or your grandmother, they offer you some key lime pie. The best pie known to human history, key lime pie. Anybody? The best pie. The, be- the best pie. And so you, you got to make a choice because they offer you pie, you know, one or two pieces. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you got to make a choice like, and by, and by the way, there's really only, only one right answer because it's key lime pie. But you got to make a choice like, are, are, this is oversimplistic, but are you going to have a piece of pie? Are you going to say yes? Are you going to eat it? Or are you going to say no? Like, there's a choice. There's really no in between. Are you going to have a piece of pie and enjoy its deliciousness, its richness, like that perfect citrusy note? With the creaminess, oh, it's, it's one, and the crumbliness of the, it's a, I can see it, yes. Brown sugar crust or like regular pie crust? Mm, I don't know. Okay, it's both, it's both good. So you're going to eat the pie or you're going to risk the status quo, not eat the pie and just miss out. And by the way, guys, you're going to have to decide and no decision is actually a decision. You see what I'm saying? Like no decision is a decision because you're not going to get it. You're going to get it or you're not. I know that's oversimplistic. But as author Josh McDowell says, the story of Jesus demands a verdict. In other words, we've got to deal with Jesus one way or another. Like we're either going to say he's who he says he is, or we're just going to reject it all. 
And as you've heard me say in here before, and I'm going to keep saying it until I'm brave and hanging out with God in heaven, there is one most important question in life. There's one, there's the most important question in life. Anybody know it? I see a couple of hands going up. What? God? That's good, that's good. So I'm going to read Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. Am I okay back there on the soundboard? I keep clicking on and off. I do not know why. Okay. I'm going to read Matthew 16, 13 through 16. You guys want to follow along. Here we go. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And so others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. So who do people say the Son of Man is? That's Jesus' favorite word for himself, Son of Man, favorite phrase for himself, Jesus. Who do people say that I am? And some people say, you're like this prophetic figure, this really important God leader figure. But what about you? What about you, he asked. Who do you say? Who do you say that I am? He's looking right at Peter. I can, I can imagine the piercing glow of Jesus' eyes. Can you imagine? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Christ. You are the Messiah, the one we've all been waiting for. You're the anointed one. You're the one to lead us to salvation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Who is Jesus? As Peter said, you're the Messiah. Jesus went on to explain, by the way, right after this, how that confession that Peter just made and that those who professed in Jesus later, how he would use them to build his church, like his church that still exists today, right? Like that, it, started, it started right there with that confession and with those people. And then he went on to talk about how he was going to die in order to save everybody, the most important act in human history. So, to Jesus' question, who am I? Peter responded, you're the Christ. And then Jesus went on to say how his response would change everything that really, truly mattered. In other words, yes, Peter, this is why your answer to that question matters. So the most important question is, who is Jesus? And the second most important question is, why does it matter? Who is Jesus and why does it matter? You're going to hear me say that so many times while you're here because we need to answer that question. It's got to be dealt with. So just go with me here. What if Jesus is exactly who he says he is? What if Jesus is, the, is God in the flesh, God's son, creator of all things, savior of the world, redeemer of all of us sinners, fixer of all of our issues with God, like our reconciler? What if he was crucified, buried, raised again on the third day, if he ascended into heaven and he's now seated at the right hand of God? we got to take that claim seriously because to tap into that is our only way back to God, to full life, to freedom, and to living with God forever safely. But to miss that, to not tap into that, according to Jesus, is to miss everything. No pie. The whole pie, no pie. So, Jesus' claim to be God, Lord, Savior, it's like dessert. It demands a verdict and a decision followed by an action. So, tall man, tall friend, sue me if I'm going to just lay it all out there. I mean, sue me, but, but I'm thinking of, of you. And today I'm thinking of you. Raise your hand if you've heard of C.S. Lewis. Any C.S. Lewis? There we go. One of the greatest Christian writers of the modern era, maybe of all time wrote The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Have you seen those movies, read those books? If you haven't, please do. They're amazing. Um, as a younger man, C.S. Lewis was, uh, he was a staunch atheist, like said, I don't believe in anything divine. He set out to disprove Christianity, actually, and in doing this, he actually found Jesus. So he set out to say Jesus is false, there is no God, and in doing all that, he found Jesus. And after that, he wrote this stuff. He wrote a book called Mere Christianity, a book everybody here should read. It's about Jesus and why we believe what we believe. Mere Christianity, write it down, remember it, put a note in your phone, put a reminder. You need to read that, if not now, by the time you're 20, Ron, like read Mere Christianity, guys. It's a great read. So in thinking about Jesus in that book, C.S. Lewis sort of writes backwards. He sort of works backwards. And I want to do that with you this morning. So in other words, like what are things that Jesus is not, that process of elimination type thing, right? So in a very famous quote from that book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis 
says this, and I want you to really tune into this. This guy's smarter than me. Um, he says more compelling things than I do, so I want you to, if you're not listening to me, it's okay, but listen to this, okay? You ready? You ready? C.S. Lewis about Jesus. C.S. Lewis, and I quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people, people often say about him, about Jesus. The thing that people often say about Jesus, and this is what they often say, I'm, re- I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis continues in response to that. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or in our day, a man who says he's Aquaman. He'd be a lunatic, back to Lewis, or else he would be the devil of hell. He would be evil. You must make your choice, he says. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not let that open to us. He did not intend to. C.S. Lewis. So let's walk through the pieces together. First, is Jesus a lunatic? Is he crazy? Well, you decide. I mean, Jesus' ways and the things he taught have molded Western society and really all society for thousands, for millennia, for thousands upon thousands of years. The, val- the values that he put forth, even for people who do not believe in him. So things like the golden rule. Anybody know the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So others said similar things, yes, throughout history, but it was Jesus who launched that and made it mainstream for much of the world. His family, by the way, they, they did think he was crazy. Not just like eccentric and different, but they thought he was crazy. But then later, they realized who he really was, and they followed him. His brother James, his brother James, led the early church in Jerusalem, believed in Jesus so strongly because he wouldn't renounce his faith and stop preaching it, the Romans took him to the pinnacle of the temple and they threw him off. And to make sure he was dead, they stoned him. That's how much James believed in his brother, who he thought was crazy, but then decided, no, he's really Lord. Guys, that is in history. The fact that they killed James, the brother of Jesus, is recorded in Roman history by Josephus really happened. And historians and those guys I mentioned earlier, like Josephus and those other guys, in strong Christian tradition tell us that the apostles and early leaders and followers of Jesus were crucified upside down and boiled in oil and things like that. Horrible things. All for a lunatic? Who does that for a lunatic? I think they would have just run. I think they would have just said, yeah, you're right. He was crazy. So what if Jesus was simply just an evil, an evil liar? C.S. Lewis, like the devil of hell, this guy's just evil. Then how was his reputation so good? Even Pilate, the Roman prefect, the governor at the time, when Jesus was sentenced to death, could not find any fault in him. I mean, he just, he literally just, guys, I'm going to leave it up to you people. And they eventually crucified him, of course. Even today, people almost always look up to Jesus, even if they don't think he was God. The problem they have is often with us, Christians, and how we act, or that kind of hurts, but, or the church, what the church does, but not what Jesus is a person. That's interesting. It's not really that common for people to say Jesus was evil. And again, why would his followers keep following him if he was an evil liar? It's phenomenal how they kept the faith even through incredible adversity. Not just the well-known ones, but numerous thousands upon thousands of regular folks being martyred all around the world to this day because they follow Jesus who is not a bald-faced liar. I just don't see people dying for that. It's just not very likely. And think about this. You and I are sitting here in this room across the vast expanse of continents and the ocean waters in a building in honor of Jesus, talking about Jesus right now, even worshiping Jesus 2,000 years later, more than 2,000 years later. The influence of this man, the influence of this man, if he's an evil liar, and that is quite a dirty hoax. Wow. Guys, you got to admit, that in of itself may not prove anything, but you got to admit something much more must be going on with this Jesus guy. In Mark chapter 3, we see that reference to his own family thinking he's crazy. And we see a reference right after that to others saying that he's evil and demon-possessed. And I'm going to let Jesus' own words kind of explain this one away a little bit. In verses 
24 through 26. You'll see more on the screen, but zero in on 24 through 26 of Mark chapter 3. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In other words, he's saying, guys, you're accusing me of being evil. But that doesn't make any sense because here I am doing good things, healing people, talking about good things, teaching good things, and that doesn't add up. Jesus himself is saying, how can I be evil if I'm working against evil? That argument cannot stand. That evil could not stand. Hmm. Okay, so what if Jesus was just a great moral teacher? And yes, he does claim to be a teacher. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. They call him rabbi. He says, yes, I am rabbi. He was a great teacher, but he was so much more. He never leaves it just as a teacher. And I love the way that C.S. Lewis dispels that thought. He's like, guys, he didn't leave us that option. He never said, I'm a teacher and left it. That never. He always said, Things like, I am Lord, I am the Son of God, I am one with God, I am the Messiah, I am the one, etc., 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 all the way to his death. And that's really what ultimately got him killed was that claim right there. So we, he just didn't leave us that option. He's not an evil liar. He's not a lunatic. He's not just a great moral teacher. Then he must be Lord. So when C.S. Lewis went off to Oxford College in England, uh, a school that was very much founded in a tradition, Christian tradition, like the greatest school ever, the oldest school ever, Oxford College. Uh, he gets off the train. He's got all these bags on him, and he starts walking to the college. And so he walks down through the town of Oxford. He's, he heard so much great about how beautiful the college was and the town was. But as he reports it, he says, you know, I kept walking, and I was getting to the end of the street, and the shops were just getting more and more plain, and houses were just getting more and more plain. And I just didn't see the beauty that they were talking about. And he said he literally came to the end of the town. And then he was like, what? And he happened to turn around and realized that he'd just been going the wrong way the entire time. Because when he turned around, that's when he beheld like the picturesque, cathedral-like domes and spires and steeples, the beauty of the towers, the beauty of Oxford College. And he was like, wow. And he later wrote about that and said, you know, that was really an analogy of my whole life. He said, my whole life I was walking in the wrong direction, looking for the wrong things. And when I turned around, there it was. Guys, there's a word we use in the church for that, for that turning around. It's the word repentance. That's all the word means. Because we walk in a certain direction, and i got to tell you guys, we're either walking away from Jesus or we're walking towards Jesus. There's, there's really not in between. When we're walking in a direction and Jesus calls for us to repent, to turn around, and just to see his majestic beauty and the majestic beauty of the life that we can have if we're with him. So that is my prayer for me, for all of us today, that if you're already a believer in Jesus, that you would run towards the beauty that Jesus offers. If you're not a believer in Jesus, you would consider these things deep into your heart because we care for you. And you consider turning around and walking towards Jesus, who with open arms will say, come on in. I've got beauty waiting for you. I've got an amazing life waiting for you, not just now, but forever. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for showing us your beauty, showing us how it was done when you came as God in the flesh showed us such amazing things, so much goodness. God, we know that we have to make a decision. And I, I pray, God, that my decision every day is to follow you better and better and that the decision of those in this room would be maybe for the first time even to follow you today. Pray that, pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.